Welcome back, traders and investors. Kyle's going to introduce a very special guest here. So I don't, I don't want to make anyone else jealous, but this might be my favorite, Joel. Miss um, Kristen Bentz, uh, I want to welcome you to the pre-market show. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm very good. So myself and uh, our CEO, found, uh, founder of Benzinga, have been huge fans of Kristen um, back in the days when um, you were at thestreet.com, um, now doing bigger, better things, uh, author of the upcoming book uh, late this summer, It's Worse Than You Think, The U.S. Economy in Decline of the Middle Class, published by Wiley. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about that today, um, including um, some favorite topics of our show and our listeners, um, JCP and um, SHLB, Joel, if you want to bring up us on the chart, but Kristen, when you talk about the decline of the middle class, what are you, what are you talking about? Well, you know, how I look at the economy is through the eyes of the consumer, because that's my specialty. So when you start seeing the economy tanking, um, the easiest way for me to use an analogy to show that happening is looking at retail stocks and retail companies, because that's what I do. So when you look at the performance um, or the precarious situation that Sears and JCPenney are in, it's a perfect way to sum up what's happened to the middle class in this country. So essentially what's happened is, you know, they've become squeezed out, left behind, and they've traded down. So that, you know, once flush customer that, you know, propped up the country essentially um, has fled. And JCPenney and Sears have been left holding the bag, kind of like, you know, where's my cheese or, dude, where's my customers? So it's not really a matter of just turning around a poorly managed or poorly run company. Their customer base has completely left them. And that's what a lot of um, investors don't really understand. So where, did, where do they go? Yeah, so looking at <laughs> J.C. Penny, I mean, this thing has doubled almost, uh, you know, since it hit this 480 bottom. So bumping up against the $9 level, I mean, was that something that surprised you? I mean, are you looking for these stores to go out of business? No, no not really. I mean, there are a lot of investors that like to play J.C.P. as a day trading stock, get in and get out which is essentially what's happening when you see these little pops. And people are so desperate <laughs> that are long for any good news that the minute they get anything <laughs> in the press, the stock will pop. That's fine. Um, but my horizon on retail is very long. And you can't turn a company like JCP in a year. So Sears, you know, I think Eddie Lamper or some of the company cloud press release, but JCPenney has, or Sears has everything it needs for this term. <laughs> well, except customers, which was my comment on Twitter. Um, these things take a really long, long time to turn, and JCPenney's problems were self-inflicted. They basically ignored proper branding, they ignored their customer, uh, and now they're chasing that business. And, you know, the um, implementations that they are making are things they used to do a long time ago. So if I was sitting across the room from the CEO and he was telling me this, you know, I'd ask, you know, pass the crap pipe, because that's what got them into this trouble in the first place. So using all these old methods that they used to use is not really going to help. So some short-term bursts, you know, that's great and fits and starts, but long-term, look at the gap. You know, 10 years ago it started its turnaround, it's still not there yet, it's still struggling. And the gap is the gap, an even more well-known brand and popular brand. So um, I just see a very long road to hole for JCPenney and Sears especially. Okay. So Kristen, Kristen, I, I find this it's really interesting because it's it's a uh, it's a big topic that um, I think is is uh, kind of a, a basis for the entire economy, like you say. And in the book, you're talking about it's worse than you think. What do you mean it's worse than you think? And and why is the companies like JCP and Sears so predictive of the decline of the o overall middle class? Well, you look at the wage inequality in this country and the declining wages recently. Um, you know, we're just not in a good place, and so there's a lot of. Uh, a lot of good things happening in the country. You know, you've got things like fracking and net gas and 3D printing and all these kind of, you know, new industries that hopefully will create jobs and, and help to lift us out of this, you know, long mire that we've been in. Um, but for the most part, you have, you know, a country that is living off of food stamps and transfer payments. And this is why we saw the recent, you know, decline in Walmart. So whenever anything happens to Walmart, people finally pay attention and freak out. What happened with the last quarter, um, it wasn't just the weather. You had, you know, millions of Americans that stopped receiving that, that extra assistance, that crisis assistance via uh, transfer payments, and that makes a difference. So a lot of folks like to give this lower-end middle class um, short shrift, 
but they really do have spending power. And even though that money is generated by the U.S. government, it does make a difference. And so Walmart really was hurt by that. So where are they going? Where are they spending? They're going and trading down to dollar stores, which is the other, you know, we're in this two-track economy, essentially. And so the fancy word for that is bifurcated market. And what does that mean? You've got the one percenters that feel great. They're expanding, they're spending, they're traveling, they're doing. Um, and then you have this low end that's basically subsisting on government assistance. And if they can't get bang for their buck at Walmart, they're going to go seek out the dollar stores. And that's why, you know, this sweepy little, you know, concept that not a lot of people really get or understand or visit is really taking their market share. And it's, it's interesting because now even Walmart is trying to do urban, smaller footprint stores. So now they're even getting it. And when they get nervous, I get nervous. <laughs> oh, okay, if there's one sector of stocks, I mean, retail stocks are crazy, uh, but it's like these teen retailers. I mean, I, they just are up or down. They're very volatile. What's a, what's your outlook on the uh, on the teen retail? Because I tell you, when I go into these malls, and I don't go in very often, you know, I look at some of these stores, and I can't imagine a person buying one article of those clothing on the racks, let, you know, let alone, I mean, I'm no, I'm no fashion expert or whatever, but, uh, man, who are they selling to? What's going on with these teen retailers? <laughs> you know, the teen space is always a fun space. It's extremely volatile, like you said, because, you know, taste and, and preference and all that stuff is completely just high beta with these names. Um, essentially, the same thing is really happening to teen retail. They're starting to implode. And, you know, my favorite stock to hate and the poster child for this bad behavior is Abercrombie and Fitch. Okay. You know, now 15 years ago, Abercrombie was amazing. They were innovative. They were the first, you know, retailer to really take the gloves off and use sex in their branding campaign. And unabashedly so, and, you know, didn't apologize for it. That was great 10 years ago. But that model needs to be updated along with the merchandise. So if you blindfolded me and put a gun to my head and, and <laughs> put me in an store, we would would drop the blindfold, <laughs> it could still look like 1986. It's the same death in a thousand cargo shorts. It's the same $88 hoodie. It's the same tank top. It's the same cycle over and over and over again. And don't get me started on their CEO who's a total whack job. But um, they essentially <laughs> are kind of, t- you know, you have these companies that are run by, you know, 55-year-old white men. And they don't really understand what's going on in the team space. I just want to follow up on just a, a technical formation here in uh, in this stock. Uh, it came way off uh, uh, the forty-two dollar level, sitting on a uh, thirty-seven, sixty-four, and sixty-seven. Uh, that was a double bottom for the last two days of trading. So below that, we got some room on the downside. Oh, definitely. So they're. Um trying to make all these changes. And it's very funny, the changes that executive committees think that they're making. So Hollister is kind of the dirty baby sister, <laughs> kind of the trashy baby sister of Abercrombie and Fitch, okay? <laughs> so Hollister has lost out on market share to companies like H&M, Forever 21, uh, because obviously teams are smart and they can realize they can get four items for the price of one at Abercrombie and Fitch. So they lost out. Not to mention their product just kind of stinks. So now they're trying to lower their pricing to compete with fast fashion. And they think that this is like this amazing hallelujah ideal for them. The problem is, again, they can't get them back now. Like once you step into a Forever 21 or an H&M and, you know, you basically realize how much you can get, that, you know, young college consumer, that high school consumer, they're not going to go back to a because there's really no reason for them to. It's too expensive and it's the same stuff. Also, there's been a shift in the way teens are branding themselves as far as logos go. So this millennial generation is very, very different than our generation. They really don't care about logos and branding. Now, they care about Beats headphones and they care about Apple products. So those technology is their fashion statement. So that really defines them. But anything else as far as apparel goes, they just want to make up their own look. They don't want to buy someone's look. You know, I mean, kind of the example that I would use, if you looked at, you know, the show or the movie Twilight, and you saw the way all the vampires are dressing, okay, these are skinny white guys with no shirts on, they're not buff Abercrombie guys. So kind of that whole 
Dracula vampire generation for me was a clue into what's happening at Team Rico. Hipster. The, the, the cool is the not cool nowadays right now, I feel like. I, t- I took my uh, 13-year-old uh, goddaughter shopping last weekend, and we walked into a store, and there was a, a big shirt of, uh, like, uh, the Rolling Stones uh, um, and Mick Jagger on, on, the, on the cover, on the shirt. And she goes, who's that? <laughs> we won't even go there. So, so Kristen, you're, you're, we got a declining middle class that's hurting the, the old retailers like JCP and Sears. We have an imploding teen retail because, uh, you know, the, the 10 years ago, the companies like Abercrombie um, aren't cutting it anymore. Uh, where does retailing go? You know, and is there any other, you know, maybe business lines that they might be able to explore um, to kind of offset both of uh, what seems obviously like very negative um, outcomes for them? Yeah, retail's in a really tough spot. And obviously, until we have, you know, more jobs in this country, um, you know, the, the unemployment, unemployment rate right now for the real rate of unemployment for teens is usually probably around 26%. Wow. It's just unreal. So, you know, those little jobs we used to get at the mall and get a discount and hang out and talk to dudes and chicks are going to 60-year-old retirees that need that money to live. So, teen retail is going to have a really, really rough time. What I'm seeing, especially I'm out here in Scottsdale, Arizona, it's kind of like the lifestyle center mecca mm-hmm. as far as retail goes. Like every bizarre concept <laughs> you can think of from food to retailers out here. And um, they're uh, blurring the lines between retail, restaurants, and luxury and hotels. So, for instance, out in Vegas, Nobu has a casino and hotel now. Okay. Now, look, I love me some sushi like the next girl, but I don't really know if I want to stay in the sushi hotel. I don't know. Um, Bulgari did the same thing. They started opening up a hotel chain. Um, in New York, there's an actual backlit building that you can move into. They're condos, and it's actually What's furnished What's the thought process on that, Kristen? What's the thought process on that? You know... It's funny. So I get a lot of my ideas for what's going on just from general pop culture and looking at magazines and advertising and who's advertising what. And I was reading an Architectural Digest. They had an ad for Diesel. We all know the French company. It's right there on, what, 34th and Lux across from Bloomingdale's. And they're now doing kitchens. <laughs> I kid you not. So you can have a Diesel kitchen in your house, condo, or apartment. I'm like, what the hell is this? So the only thing that I can make of it is they're going into the luxury space as fast as they possibly can to offset everything else. I mean, look, the big news in New York is Brooks Brothers is opening up a steakhouse at the New York location right in Midtown. Wow. Wow. Now, I I get it. I get the steak thing, and I get New York, and I get the Brooks Brothers customer. I get that. But I guess they're trying to take a page from Tommy Bahama. Now, out here in Phoenix, that is the thing. You go to Tommy Bahama... You pray to your God, and then you're eating a Cobb salad. Yep. So <laughs> it works. I don't know. But I, I find it very odd. I, it, the only thing that I can think of is it's just desperation. And they're trying to make the brand as relevant as possible with as many um, lucrative channels as they possibly can. So I think that's why they're really seeking out this luxury host, hotel um, residence space and uh, interior space. So it's something to watch. Just popped up on my radar. I thought it was really interesting. So do you think that uh, you know they're think kind of throwing uh, good money after bad by these uh, these retailers getting into the restaurant business? Because I mean anybody that knows that's ever been involved in a restaurant business or bar business, that's one tough business. And uh, oh you, yeah, you think it? Well, just, especially uh, retail too. And so you know. Folks that aren't exactly educated don't realize that the two just don't happen. The two businesses, although they may seem to cater to the same person, are extremely different. So if you're running a retail business and you don't bring in someone from the restaurant industry to run that angle, that's a recipe for disaster. I mean, it'll just be horrific. So um, it'll be really interesting to watch. I think in some cases it can be good money after bad. Um, Brooks Brothers has done a lot of innovative things lately. They're really trying to reach you know, their consumer. If you look at their branding, it's just a, a tad hipper, um, a tad sexier. So I do know, and they have this new CEO who's pretty amazing, but they're, they're trying to you know, go after. Their problem is they have to um, curate that you know, normal customer that's 60 that has been wearing Brooks Brothers since he was in boarding school. And then they also have to attract that new kind of Brooklyn hipster that wants to be refined but also have a little edge. And that's a very tough um, line to walk. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Hey, Joel, why, uh, how did the hipster burn his tongue? Uh, I don't know. 
<laughs> oh, no, I type a joke. I, I forgot. It's, it's something about pizza, and it's not, you know, he ate it before it's cool. That's it. Oh, Joel, that's I don't know if Joel knows what a hipster is, uh, Kristen. I am uh, a hipster, <laughs> and I'm the hipster <laughs> dude in this office here, that double um, everyone's age. But, uh, <laughs> Kristen, I just want to go into something here. Uh, I mean, you're giving a kind of a, a, and correct me if I'm wrong, kind of a negative look on, on retail in general. Uh, you know, you're talking about, you know, the J.C. Pennies and the Sears Holdings and stuff, and, you know, mm -hmm. I guess that's not, I mean, if you're a major bull in the market, and I'm sure you have to relate your findings and your research to the market, uh, we've had a tremendous, I mean, are you kind of, are you getting bearish up here, or do you think that, you know, they'll just find another sector to go into? Because once the retail starts to turn, and correct me if I'm wrong, boy, that could be a bad signal for the rest of the economy. Well, exactly. So, and, and there, I am extremely bearish, and that's why the name of the book is It's Worse Than You Think. Now, while there are a lot of good things happening in the country, right, there are some glimmers. Um, unfortunately, it's not really enough to lift us out of this kind of, you know, stagnation, this 2% GDP stagnation that we've been left with. Um, if you want to play this market, and I spoke uh, in New Jersey last week when I was in town to 17, you know, wealth managers, and if you really want to play the sector, you have to go along luxury. Okay. And that's everything from Whole Foods, you know, and William Sonoma and that sort of thing, all the way up to Caring, Gucci, you know, Prada, um, that, that sort of thing. So that customer is where it's at. So if you want to play that retail play, you either need to go extremely low end, like dollar stores, or extremely high end. So you think the people that have the money, even in a bear market, are still going to spend the money? And the people that they will. They will just spend less. So I came out of, you know, the New Markets Retailing Program when I was like a little baby intern. And then, you know, funny turn of events, then I'm an analyst working at Lehman and I'm covering the stock. So I'm sitting across from Bert Kansky, um, and uh, we're sitting there talking, and this was, you know, probably in the early 90s when we had that bottom fall out of the market. And so we're sitting there at Bert Ruff Goodman in New York, and he's like, you know, the Neiman Marcus customer never really goes away. You know, instead of buying three Chanel suits, they're buying one. And he truly is correct. That's exactly how they work. So it's not that they don't spend money, they just spend it much more wisely, so they might buy one really amazing timepiece or one great trip. Um, so definitely, if, you know, that, that's the only movement that's really happening right now um, at retail is this high-end consumer. They feel good. They want to travel. They want to buy things. They love technology. And uh, they love luxury goods. They're the thirst for luxury they goods. They um, So do you pay, you know, I know you do, you, you're very uh, thorough on your fundamental analysis. Uh, do you pay much attention to technical analysis? You know, I do. It's funny. Usually, um, so my co-author that I'm writing the book with is uh, the chief economist at Bloomberg LP. His name is Joe Busuelos. So he provides what I call all the chart porn. <laughs> okay. And I come at him with uh, the fundamental analysis. And the thing that's very interesting about the work that we've done on this book and the work that we do daily is that whatever I'm seeing will come back to look exactly the same way in the data visu visualization that he makes. So the technicals are there. He usually flushes them out. And then we can actually see, you know, there's a reason. So if you look at teen retail imploding, part of the reason for that is that males 20 to 50, 5 million males have left the workforce, stopped looking for work, and are just giving up 20 to 50. That's your prime money-making time. That's your prime, you know, make a career time. And these guys have just had it, and they're quitting. So if you think about who teen dads are, well, there's a reason for that. So if they're supplying, you know, all the, all the mall money and they just quit and they're going away, it's no surprise that that's happening. So that's where my technicals will come into play. Also, if I just see a stock that's struggling, like look at A&F, then I'll pull up the chart and take a look at it. What about this, whole, usually, what about this whole foods chart? I mean, this thing has been, it's come off the $64 level. It's bumping up against the lows of the move here at, uh, at uh, the $50 level. I mean, it's just, you're just, you know, waiting for like some kind of basic pattern or do you make your recommendations to the clients and let them make their own decisions? I usually do that. I've kind of gotten away from this, like, you know, back up the truck kind of, <laughs> <laughs> kind of theory. I'm very, because I came out of the fashion industry, my calls are very early. They're very good and they're right, but they're early. So my call on Abercrombie is a short, you know, I got beat to hell for it because it was way early on that, but I'm right. 
So I usually let my clients kind of, you know, if you want to short my idea, that's awesome. You want to go long my idea, that's fine too. But I'm going to tell you what I'm seeing, and I'm usually pretty, um, you know, vigilant about, and I have a lot of, I have a lot of conviction, obviously, on my ideas. Yeah. So um, I'll tell you what I see, and then you can be the judge and trade accordingly. Well, I promise you one thing. I am long, talented, blonde, Joel. Um, I cannot wait for your book to come out this summer. It's worse than you think. The U.S. middle class. Uh, Kristen, I, I hope to have you on uh, again very soon and continue this theme. Uh, it's something that we follow really closely at Benzinga with all the retail stocks. Um, and I want to thank you for coming on, and I hope your, uh, your, your first experience with us was a good one. Well, I can't wait to come back, so thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. You guys are awesome, and just, you know, call me anytime. Yeah, Chris, All right. Kristen, I heard a lot of good things about you, especially from the Brenster and stuff, and, uh, you know, he, uh, <laughs> you, you, did not, you did not disappoint me at all. Jason and Joe say uh, hi from 10,000 feet. They're flying out to Arizona. So, uh, well, tell them to hurry up because it's a beautiful day. The sun's just coming up, and we've got a lot of golf and a lot of baseball coming up at you. So hey, just, I expect to see them on the links. <laughs> okay. All right. Actually, violin maker, just doing a quick question. We're going to end it with this. When you say you're early, you know, with your calls, you know, what mm -hmm. kind of what kind of time frame are, are are you are you looking at? Are you looking at a two, a six month, a year time frame? Because timing is everything in this market. Oh yes, it is in all things, my dear. Um, so when you're in the fashion industry, you're usually buying or putting putting together a line six months before. Okay, so that's why, you know, we have Fashion Week in New York in September. You're looking at, you know, spring merchandise, right? So usually my calls are a little bit early, about six months, which is not exactly bad. But as long as you have that in mind, then you can, okay. you know, take time to set up your plan. Okay, thank you so much for this informative interview, and uh, we'll be sure to get you back on again soon. Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. Have a great day.